It gives me great pleasure to introduce our main speaker, Anita Simons, who is an honorary consultant in respiratory medicine and sleep medicine at the Royal Brompton Hospital in the UK, London. She's a professor emeritus of respiratory and sleep medicine at the National Heart and Lung Institute, Imperial College, London. And she's also editor of the ERS Respiratory Medicine and ERS Practical Handbook on Non-Invasive Ventilation. She was president of the European Respiratory Society between 2020 and 2021 and has had a amazing career looking after individuals on home mechanical ventilation with a particular interest of those with neuromuscular disorders, both adult and paediatric and in non-invasive ventilation and palliative care. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Simons for today's talk, when to withdraw home mechanical ventilation, experience of end of life. She's a fantastic role model and has so much experience that this lecture is going to be amazing. No pressure there, Michelle. Okay, so this, well, thank you for the topic and thank you um, to Briaz too. This can be, I think, uh, not a straightforward and, and sometimes a challenging topic. And so that's why I think it's an excellent area for us to discuss and share experiences in. And I don't have any conflicts of interest for this presentation. So for completeness, I'm going to cover three areas. First, briefly, I'm going to talk about elective withdrawal of ventilatory support due to improvement in ventilatory status. Uh, that's a relatively unusual situation and one can often see it in children, but in adults too. So I'll deal with that relatively briefly and then to move on to uh, somewhat more thorny issues. And that is first withdrawal of ventilation when the burden of ventilation outweighs the benefit fit it offers the patient and then finally we'll talk about withdrawal of ventilation at the end of life as part of palliative care. So first um, to talk about successful paediatric NIV or CPAP withdrawal when it's no longer required and I think the main situations where you see that are in children who have uh, congenital upper airway syndromes such as Pierre Robin syndrome and it's possible to withdraw ventilation because of airway growth as a child becomes older the airway develops and uh, they no longer require CPAP or ventilatory support. There is a similar situation you can see in individuals um, with upper airway syndromes or maybe straightforward of start to sleep apnea who that situation is improved because they have upper airway surgery such as tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy and then there's the very positive situation where you can withdraw ventilation in children and adults of course uh, with obesity hyperventilation syndrome if they lose weight. Um, there are other syndromic conditions where it's possible to withdraw treatment uh, because of specific treatment such as growth hormone in Prada and Willy syndrome and the weight loss that may follow that. And then there are other uh, situations that you see relatively often and that is there has been recovery of lung function perhaps in a young child following complex cardiac surgery or in an infant following um, recovery and lung growth and that infant has had uh, lung disease of prematurity. And just to look at the kind of uh, prevalence, the, the kind how, how often one can do that, this is a series of almost 500 children started on non-invasive ventilation and I've just highlighted here the groups in whom it was possible to withdraw either CPAP or non-invasive ventilation. Uh, you can see relatively small numbers but the main groups as I just mentioned were upper airway syndromes uh, following cardiac surgery, other congenital um, syndromes that's for CPAP and for withdrawal of non-invasive ventilation. Again, um, as mentioned, children with chronic lung disease with the recovery of lung function, congenital syndromes, upper airway problems, a few with other and a handful of those with children who weren't able to continue to adhere to therapy. Um, but overall, I think you get the picture of the sorts of conditions where largely growth enables withdrawal of treatments and in fact the proportion here, so this was about 9% of the patients who started on ventilation, so relatively small proportion. And of course um, to make the right decisions in this group, 
it's necessary to be aware that this is a possibility. In fact, sometimes the families tell you and that they've actually tried, a uh, child's had a sleepover, they've child, tried a few nights without the ventilator and things have been fine. Of course, you can refer to your regular monitoring and then you need to assess for a period without the ventilatory support. If you're unsure of the situation, it might be, for example, that you do a split night study first. They're not perfect studies because there's not the same amount of REM sleep and so forth in each half of the night, but it gives you some idea. Or it might be possible to actually assess the child after withdrawal for uh, two or three or four nights. And that gives you a more clear idea of, of how long they can remain without ventilatory support. There's obvious relevance, of course, to adults, and I think the situations where we see it's possible to withdraw are following weight loss after bariatric surgery uh, and after uh, a prolonged recovery period after any other sort of major surgery. So that's the first sort of withdrawal. Um, the second type is really uh, one where the burden of treatment outweighs the benefit that it offers to that individual. And this, I think, is a, an important concept. I think we've been aware for a long time about the burdens of the underlying disease. But of course, what we're applying on top of that is, is treatment burdens. And as you can see here in this paper from Lydia Spur, the treatment burden is, is generally seen as the workload of the healthcare and its impact on the individual's functioning and well-being. And if you overburden an individual, it's relatively obvious to see that it's going to lead to outcomes which are suboptimal, the individual might not be able to comply and adhere to that therapy. Uh, they may then disengage from, from follow-up, from treatment because they're worried about not, not complying with treatment and you uh, force on patients decisions about which treatments they're going to prioritise. And I think this schematic makes it relatively, or it makes it clear in non-invasive ventilation that there are a number of um, uh, pressures that can contribute to the burden, the time and effort required to use the device, there's some um, maintenance required, and of course it inevitably requires more contact with um, healthcare professionals to order parts, to come to clinics, to have sleep studies, to check efficacy of therapy. The psychology of non-invasive ventilation, which um, is much more of a factor for some individuals than others. Uh, and it clearly has an impact on their social life, their professional life, travel. Uh, it adds complications to all those areas of life. And we're there to support them and help them with that. And of course, that's we should be able to anticipate the kind of burdens that are created. But these are an add-on to the burden of the disease, the comorbidities and the underlying chronic respiratory failure. And it makes even more important the fact that we are sharing decision making with the patient so we understand the impact of treatment and it can be something that we can underestimate the impact of our therapy. We can be very glad that we've reduced the CO2 from 7.4 to 6.6 .6 kilopascals, but if that is at a cost for the patient of insomnia, upper airway symptoms, the fact that they can't do some of the things they were doing previously, then that um, burden is very significant. And it has to, of course, be the perceived benefit to the individual. It's not what we think the benefit is, it's what that individual experiences it as. So I just want to uh, run through a case. Um, for us to consider, this is a 77-year-old retired teacher with severe COPD, predominantly emphysema, presented quite a while back with an acute exacerbation. Interestingly, she had chronic changes related to um, infection and she did have Pseudomonas isolated uh, among other organisms. And during this year, she had three exacerbations. Her sleep study um, on oxygen therapy, which she was already on for classic indications, showed a mild degree of hypercapnia. And because of the um, uh, hypercapnic exacerbations, um, her COPD treatment obviously was optimized. And she was offered NIV at that point because she fulfilled um, indications, but she didn't wish to up take it, take up that opportunity at that time. But the subsequent year, 
she had a further chest infection uh, and sleep study and she decided to start NIV at that point. Initially she felt much brighter, uh, she had a course of treatment for pseudomonas eradication and she had a repeat pulmonary rehabilitation course. Uh, by the following year she'd had two further hypercapnic exacerbations and her lung function was deteriorating. Uh, she used NIV for the hypercapnic exacerbations each time went home with the ventilator, but it became clear from the adherence data that she wasn't using the NIV um, uh, consistently at home. And so an admission was required to restart the NIV. She had further IV antibiotics during that admission. But interestingly, it's a relatively steady state admission. You can see that despite the fact she wasn't using the NIV, her PCO2 was relatively stable, at, uh, just elevated at 6.6 .6 kilopascals. Uh, and that was compensated on her oxygen. It's seen in the clinic notes that she was using a wheelchair for the first time in the clinic this time and so functionally she was um, continuing to deteriorate. Over the next year or so um, her use of NIV was intermittent, uh, she reported not sleeping well, she had an oxygen titration uh, study with her NIV and because of her reduced uh, mobility she uh, started to have outreach visits from the team and they usually found that she was not using the NIV at home. She had further investigations just to make sure in view of her deteriorating um, function that there was no other pathology and that um, didn't seem to be the case. And here we're hitting the COVID period, so she was having home visits, she was switched to another ventilator because of her poor tolerance uh, in AVAPS mode. She was having mask issues at that point and she had a number of home visits and teleconsults uh, during the height of the first um, COVID wave. More um, exacerbations managed predominantly at home with steroids and antibiotics, but more symptoms between exacerbations. Um, a, a major admission, <coughs> excuse me, in March 2021 with, with drowsiness, increased hypercapnia, um, worse saturations. This time she did seem to have a, a, a pulmonary embolism, a relatively small one. She was starting on a, a pixaban and immediately had a very large nosebleed. It's notable at that point to control her CO2. She required uh, a high e IPAP settings, 32, EPAP of 10. Um, her ambulatory oxygen requirement increased and she was now not leaving the house. Two weeks after that admission, she was readmitted again with a further exacerbation, uh, very breathless, uh, not tolerating her, her ventilator. Uh, she had severe back pain uh, from a prolapsed disc associated with osteoporosis. Um, and although she had had some intermittent palliative care consults before, she was now started on morphine. She had a complex home care package arranged and was started on high flow nasal oxygen therapy at night and discharged home with the high flow nasal oxygen therapy, but also with her ventilator to use um, as she wished. And very sadly, and perhaps not unexpectedly, she died six days later at home. And just before we reflect on the details of those cases, uh, some information on uh, long-term NIV and quality of life in COPD patients. This is a paper looking at the SRI, the sphere of respiratory um, insufficiency measure of health-related quality of life in patients with various pathologies, thoracic cage problems, uh, neuromuscular disorders, obesity hyperventilation, and the black bars of the COPD patients. And you can see for the overall and individual um, aspects of the SRI, other than the uh, the physical function, which is obviously going to be worse in the <clears throat> neuromuscular patients, you can see that overall the quality of life is consistently not as good in COPD as it is in those other pathologies. And if we review the randomized controlled trials, the original McAvoy trial didn't show a difference in St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire at 12 months. Um, a patient outcome measure 
actually showed some aspects of quality of life were worse in um, COPD patients. These are the randomized trials, of course, of NIV uh, versus long-term oxygen therapy. The Conline study, the steady state hypercapnia study, did show some improvements in the generic SF36 and the St. George's Research Questionnaire. Uh, and so that formed the basis of the recommendations of the ATS-ERS guideline for N uh, NIV and COPD. Having said that, the STRIC study, which was, if you remember, the um, post-discharge randomization to NIV or um, oxygen therapy alone, showed only a trend in quality of life sc scores in the NIV group, and they were not significant. And the Murphy study, the hot HMV study, showed a trend in the general indices at six weeks an improvement in the St. George's Restoratory Questionnaire at three months, but subsequently no difference in quality of life. And I think the takeaway from that is that um, clearly some patients do, uh, and in fact, I would say many patients do experience uh, initial improvements in quality of life, and that may be maintained for some while, but it's really important for us to continue to assess the quality of life as the disease evolves. And most of these studies are only carried out for a year and yet we're continuing to see patients for one, two, three, four, five years. And we need to know and understand the balance between the improvements that the NIV has um, offered and the burden that it creates for patients. And so going back to that particular case, I think on reflection, those recurrent attempts to optimize, in inverted commas, therapy tell their own story. And I think it's important that we should consider that maybe it's not the wrong mask or the wrong settings or even the wrong ventilator, but maybe we have the wrong patient. To understand whether something is going to be effective for someone or whether the burden of therapy um, is an issue for them, you don't usually know till you try it. So I think a, a time-based trial is, is, is always worthwhile and worth discussing with the patient. Um, and as we saw, the, the, that patient initially felt better. She initially um, found her sleep quality was better uh, with NIV, but subsequently it did become more burdensome. And she told us that because she wasn't using it con con consistently really crucial is the fact that withdrawing NIV because its burden uh, exceeds benefit is not a failure. It definitely is not a failure. What it does, it, it's not a failure for the patient and it's not a failure for you or the treatment. It, what it does is it allows you to refocus on what does work for the patient, what works on palliating their symptoms, and you can share with decision making as what is the right way forward for the patient at that point. So, having covered that area, I now move to the, the last area, which is withdrawal of NIV at the end of life. And I, I think we're all aware that there are some important considerations here, that medical legal issues can vary from country to country, and certainly cultural and religious views may play a significant part in the decision making in this area. And I'm really glad that Mike Campbellmacher is here at the end so we can discuss some of his experiences and how things are in the Netherlands. So what are we talking about here? Well, this is NIV withdrawn in someone at the end of their life with terminal disease. And it is ethical for withdrawal at this point. If it's the patient's wish, their settled wish over time, and they have the capacity to make that decision. It's their decision. It is very definitely not assisted suicide or euthanasia. It's withdrawal of ventilation. It can be managed successfully um, in hospital. Of course, this is something we do quite often in other areas of care, um, in hospices and in the patient's home. For obvious reasons, most experience has been gained in patients with ALS, motor neuron disease, and the whole process um, I think is best done in a multidisciplinary way, jointly with um, respiratory teams, uh, home ventilation teams, um, palliative care teams, primary care may be involved, and the local team for patients where shared care is being carried out. The cause of death in this situation is the patient's underlying disease. It is not the withdrawal of the ventilatory support. 
And these decisions are part of the advanced care planning framework that we should be um, applying and all patients and coming to these decisions jointly. This is a rather nice schematic from a, a US paper, but it makes the point that these discussions are, are part of the overall care, some uh, discussions at the time of diagnosis, depending on the diagnosis, and then throughout the disease trajectory, and then further discussions um, with the patient as they're coming to the end of their life. And we're making uh, advanced dishes, decisions are there to refuse treatment. And I think for NIV therapy in motor neurone disease, it's helpful to have a conversation when you're starting NIV along the lines of this is something that we think and hope you're going to find helpful and what we hope is that you will continue to use it as long as you find it helpful and then you can take that where you want to at that point uh, and continue to have the, those discussions. So one more case, uh, this is a 76 year old um, businessman, although he was continuing to sit on, um, uh, be partially involved in the business, although he was retired and he'd just been diagnosed with MND ALS and was referred straight away to the respiratory team, which is practice as it should be. You can see that at presentation he had impaired uh, respiratory function with a sniff and spiritually pressure reduced at 45 centimetres of water. He was a non-smoker, not surprisingly, had normal PO2 at that time, but PCO2 at the upper limit of normal, a very classic presentation, compatible with quite significant respiratory muscle weakness. Um, and at the very first visit, the patient brought up the, the topic of advanced care. And interestingly, he said something to me like, you won't make me go on after I want to go on. This was the first initial conversation that we had. Um, he had a sleep study within a few days, which showed uh, nocturnal hypoventilation. And I had very poor sleep quality, very frequent arousals. He was started on um, NIV and his sleep quality improved um, very, very quickly. He took to NIV from the first night and felt much more alert. He then continued with um, NIV at night, but after about four months started to use it um, with afternoon naps. By about a year after diagnosis, he was still ambulant, but walking with um, support. There was a change in his swallowing, but video fluoroscopy showed the swallowing was safe and with changes to his diet, he was able to continue eating and he said he did not want a peg or a rig. We were fortunate to have um, palliative care involvement with joint clinics and the patient himself decided to move to London. He lived in the country uh, to be nearer uh, respiratory support. That was his choice. About 18 months after the diagnosis, he became 24 hour uh, NIV dependent. Uh, he didn't wish to have a tracheostomy uh, and it was possible to clear his secretions. He wasn't subject to, to chest infections with an ambu bag, which his wife was able to use for secretion clearance. Um, and he didn't feel he needed a cough assist machine. He was still able to have holidays in the countryside with his daughter. He had a full time carer. But as time um, was passing, so this was uh, a little, a month or two later, he was more uh, symptomatic. Um, he had poor tolerance for, of, of, of treatment for aches and pains and breathlessness. Uh, and there was extensive discussion about um, uh, symptom relief uh, with our palliative care team and, and with the GP who was immensely helpful. Um, he again reiterated after discussion that he didn't wish to have a tracheostomy or further extension of life and um, uh, uh, decided that he wished to have the ventilator withdrawn at home. Um, he had full capacity to make that decision. So after discussion with his family, um, who were very supportive, plans were made for withdrawal at home. And within a, a week or two of that, after a small party at home with the family, 
uh, with champagne toast. Um, he uh, retired to the bedroom and GP was present as well as a palliative care nurse, uh, a subcutaneous infusion of, of diamorphine and midazolam was started by a syringe driver. The NIV was withdrawn uh, three hours later when there was no eyelash reflex, he was unrousable and having withdrawn the ventilator, um, he died after a further three hours with his family present. So what are our reflections from that case? Well, we know from the randomized trials that NIV can extend life, but the quality of that life can only be judged by um, the individual themselves. Um, Palliative care input is, is really important and we can offer a palliative care, we can be advised by our, our palliative care team colleagues um, and we can relieve symptoms. The loss of autonomy is something that is really difficult to alleviate and is very important to some patients, more important to some individuals than others. As we've said before, withdrawal of NIV is permissible ethically. The patient can make the decision, they have the capacity to make the decision and that's their considered view over time and the family supports that view and as I've said in, in this um, particular case, the GP and the palliative care nurse are immensely valuable. The patient died of their motor neurone disease and the respiratory failure it caused, not from the withdrawal of the ventilator. So it, before we come to our discussion and Q&A, I just want to run through some of the guidance that is available. And these are guidelines from the Association of Palliative Medicine of Great Britain and Ireland, which um, I think many of us have found helpful. You may have your own guidelines in your own country. Uh, there is a web link included in the slides. So some principles of palliative care um, removal of, of, of ventilatory support. Um, it is a unique journey and it's going to be different. It's going to vary for each patient and their family. It's the patient's right to make this decision and it's the duty of the, those who are looking after the individuals to um, make uh, their uh, wishes come true. Um, the communication, as in everything in medicine, really the communication is so, so important, especially understanding the medical legal aspects and what the plan is going to be. As we've said before, teamwork is vital and the, the psychological support for the patient, the family and the team involved is just as crucial as the practicalities. There are some generalizable principles, but the precise methodology and what you do on the day um, will vary according to the individual patient. And a really key point here, this is this is something that is, is not done that often. It's probably done increasingly, but there is uh, a, a very sparse evidence base and therefore there's need for discussion and for us to carry on evaluating the outcomes and what we do. These are the standards of care that were set for, for the Association for Palliative Medicine. Um, that the patient should be informed that this is a possibility for them and that they can be supported in this decision if this is what they want. I should say at, at this point that it is the minority of patients um, with motor neurone disease that, that choose this option. The vast majority continue with NIV or tracheostomy ventilation until they die. Um, but this is an important subgroup. A senior clinician, you note I haven't said what type of clinician should, should validate the patient's decision and lead the withdrawal. So someone should be in charge and it should take place within a reasonable time frame after the patient has made the request. Uh, so they shouldn't be left hanging around for six months until people get their act together. Um, of course, we should anticipate that if we withdraw the ventilation, then there uh, will be uh, associated symptoms and those symptoms should be um, preemptively managed and that all the f family members should have the appropriate support uh, wherever this is done um, in, in a hospital, in a hospice or at home. As we've said right from the beginning, this, this can be a challenging area for lots of reasons. Firstly, that because it's done um, infrequently, then most um, healthcare professionals are not going to have a lot of experience. They may only be doing occasional cases. 
Um, there's considerable variation in practice. It doesn't, probably because there's no one right way of doing things, um, but we really want to make sure that we have the best outcome possible. Uh, and never a truer word was said, the emotional stakes are very high and there can be misunderstandings from family members, from other healthcare professionals involved in your own team or other related teams as to what is uh, the correct way to do things medically legally and um, really one needs a framework to do things properly. What are your responsibilities as a, as a um, health professional? Well, you don't have to participate in this if it um, is not uh, in alignment with your own religious or moral or other personal beliefs, so you don't have to participate. But importantly, if you decide not to do that, you should make sure that there are other clinicians, other team members that can um, fulfill the patient's request. So it's not acceptable to leave the patient without anywhere to turn to, as, as the GMC says here, as the General Medical Council. What are the practicalities? Well, it's good, good to get these right first. Um, I, I think as as most people would do, multidisciplinary team meetings are there to ensure that everyone is on board, um, that all the patient knows what's going to happen. All the family members are in are in, in agreement, and I mean all the family members, um, that everyone understands the ethical legal basis of what is going to happen and are familiar with the plan. Then in terms of uh, the uh, sedation that is required, then usually at home, I think one would tend to use subcutaneous um, uh, delivery of medication, and this is the suggestion from the palliative care guidelines. Uh, you may wish to start with a syringe driver and infusion and then add aliquots as suggested here, or add, uh, start with a stat dose. Um, often in hospital, IV delivery is, is preferred, and this is the suggestions here from the guideline. Uh, especially at home, if you're delivering the treatment subcutaneously, I think you may want to consider having several sites for, for butterflies to make sure that one doesn't tissue. And if you're using IV delivery at home, then you, you, you should have to have someone around who can replace the IV if it tissues um, subsequently in the procedure. So uh, just think through what, what can happen and what might go wrong. Now with the having started the sedation, uh, some teams uh, elect to tail down the ventilator setting, so reduce the IPAP and the backup rate. Uh, other teams don't do that. Um, but the removal of the mask is usually done when the patient is unrousable and I find it very helpful to know that there's no eyelash reflex whatsoever. Make sure the ventilator alarms, humidifier alarms are disabled because the last thing you want when you're gently removing the mask is suddenly mayhem to, to start with the alarms going off. That's not a control way of doing things. It is possible to add oxygen if the patient has been on it previously at home, so just gently replace the mask with nasal cannulae, but most um, ALS, motor neurone disease patients are not on oxygen. Often oxygen is, is not there at home, and I, I certainly don't think it's um, essential. As I've occasionally used it in, in hospital in this situation, the patient becomes very cyanose and the family are worrying about that. I don't think it's an issue for the patient, but it's certainly not essential. And um, one thing to bear in mind is that the time it then takes for the patient to die can be quite variable. And I would say it might take longer than you expect. And I'll just show you some information on that. The family's participation is entirely up to them. Uh, they may wish to be present the whole time, they may wish to come and go, it may take a while, the whole process, whatever they choose to do. I've seen um, in children in particular where this has been managed in hospital that on two occasions when the mother wished to remove the mask personally um, and then the, the, the child was on their lap. Um, so it's whatever, whatever is right for them. 
This is a very helpful paper from Ben Messer and Alison Armstrong from Newcastle showing a case series of six patients where they withdrew support in ALS patients and they uh, indicate here the time from the request of the patient to the withdrawal so it was done um, in, in a timely way. Uh, they uh, tail down the settings and you can see generally half the IPAP sort of 22 to 10, 26 to 12, and they tail down the backup rate, 12 to 8, you can see here 15 to 8, um, no other settings changed in particular. And you can see they time, so each patient is, is their own control in a way, it's going to take a different time for each individual depending on their ventilatory capacity, uh, and even if they seem totally ventilator dependent, it's surprising that you can see the time, very um, variable times um, of the whole withdrawal process. And then this is amount, the amount of time from withdrawing the mask itself, so stopping the ventilator till death. So within moments to 32 hours. This was uh, kind of planned over that period of time, but you can see very variable indeed. Um, and this is a case from, from, the, from the guideline. We have some patients on tracheostomy ventilation at home. This was a patient who had had an emergency tracheostomy for her uh, motor neurone disease. And she'd had, uh, after two years, um, she was consistent in her request uh, that her quality of life was no longer what she wished it to be and that um, the burdens of ventilation outweighed any benefit. She had had a subcutaneous infusion for symptom palliation for some months and you can see the additions to treatment that were made. So the subcutaneous uh, infusion was increased. You can see a patient gradually deteriorated and became unresponsive. Um, at this point, she was given a further stat dose um, to be absolutely sure that um, she was comfortable and she died very quickly afterwards. There is also a publication from a Danish team. Uh, this is a 10-year study during which they uh, had experience with 12 patients with ALS who were all on 24-hour tracheostomy ventilation at home. They'd all made advanced directives at the start of mechanical ventilation that they wished for it to be withdrawn in the terminal stage. And then uh, you can see the median time um, from the start of ventilation to withdrawal was about two years. It was, there's not a lot of detail in the paper, but was the reason for withdrawal in all the cases was described as the patients felt the meaning of life was lost for them at that point. And they used a mixture of opiate and uh, benzodiazepine, but they used diazepam and used um, preemptive sedation as we've described in the other cases. And finally, I'm just going to run through before our discussion some of the recorded experiences of healthcare professionals in carrying out uh, end of life withdrawal. In this survey, this was um, recently published of around 42 cases of withdrawal of ventilation at home. Um, I think some were at home, some at hospital, majority of at home. There were good experiences. I've decided to list here the difficult experiences just so we can learn from them. Uh, not sedated enough. Um, first patient I had dealt with. So, you know, there is an issue of building experience. If you can share this experience with a, um, with, with a team first before you perhaps lead on it, uh, know the patient well, huge responsibility, very alert and chatty prior to sedation. And that was the experience we had with the patient who actually toasted everyone and made a speech before he decided to go to his bedroom and for the withdrawal to start. Uh, thankful two consultants were present. Patient's threshold to sedation was difficult to manage, not able to stay till he died. And I think this, you do need to prepare that it might take longer than you think. And therefore, are you able to stay for that period of time? And if you're not, who amongst the team is going to be able to stay to the end? Um, and this, I think, is very telling. I felt very pressurized to make everything go perfectly, especially with the family and the whole team watching. So this is a difficult process to, to lead and make sure it goes as well as possible. And to do that, I think what you really need is a plan.
because if you've got all the practicalities sorted out in your minds, the team know their own role in this process, then you can focus on the patient and you can um, observe them, understand how, this, how everything is process, um, uh, progressing. You can um, be sensitive to the needs of the family, who's adjusting well, who's not coping, all those things you can focus on. This is a nice checklist from, from the guidance, making sure at the beginning you've got all the um, practicality is right, the decision making is correct and you've recorded those, you have a team there, you have the, all the equipment you use, um, extra butterflies, you have uh, the medications you need, uh, the water for injection, all those things are there and then you have a, a plan of who you're liaising with and what you're going to do after uh, the patient dies in terms of notifying key individuals, who's going to collect the equipment, I think it's probably quite helpful to do that subsequently, not clear it all away in the, say, the ventilator that is, but some families may wish that to be done and then that you audit your process. Um, I'm glad to say that it's also recorded some very positive feedback from the families and they identified a number of themes that the families uh, uh, described. Um, that they were surprised how peaceful and dignified it was. They were very pleased with how the process went at home. Uh, they also felt it was hugely important that, that this was what the patient themselves wanted. Very grateful for the way it was managed. Uh, it couldn't have been managed any better. What a wonderful thing to hear. Um, and that they were pleased that the patient um, had been involved in decision making and had control right up until the last. And then another nice uh, comment here, um, the family were very pleased, they were supported by the team they knew well, um, um, were grateful to be able to support the patient in what were his long-term wishes. So with that, um, I think if, if there is an afterwards. Um, and so one is continuing to support the patients in the practicalities, the bereavement, I think getting back to the family uh, and you'll be able to judge whether it's important to do that the next day or the next week or how that continued support should work best and then thinking about the team uh, and reflecting on how, how did it go uh, and what can we learn. Uh, I'm ending with some comments on what might be a good death um, and for you to decide, I'm not going to read them out, whether a withdrawal is consistent with doing all these things. A patient knows when the death is coming, they have dignity and privacy, there's control over their pain relief, um, they can control who's present there and here at the bottom, they're able to leave when it's time time for them to go and not have their life prolonged pointlessly. Far be from me to add anything to something Socrates has said, but you, you could, I suppose, say that a good death and maybe even a good life and a good death may be the greatest of all human blessings. And then as Cecily Saunders said, how we do this is important because um, how people die really affects the memories of those who are there, their families and their friends and those who continue. And so I'm just going to remind you now before we go on to the Q&A of what the session is next time. This is transitioning a child to home with a ventilator. But I'm going to hand back to Michelle and Mike for our um, Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. That was an excellent presentation, as always, and answers lots of questions along with some real practical tips that will help everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce Mike Campbellmacher, who is a consultant physician with over 30 years experience of home mechanical ventilation, firstly in the University of Ulrich, but now heads the home mechanical ventilation team in Antwerp. So thank you, Mike, for joining us. While I'm waiting for a couple of extra questions to be posted, but we do already have some, um, I wanted to ask one of my questions to start with, which is what happens, we quite often see families and patients are not on the same page, that some of the family will be and some of them won't. And I think that that can cause 
a lot of issues in the clinical setting when a patient says, look, I would like my ventilator withdrawn, but you have family members that are very much against that. And I just wondered um, if I could have your views on that. Well, uh, as you imply, that that is a situation everyone has to be on board. Um, and I, I don't think it's different in some ways to other conversations you have about other uh, advanced directives about whether a patient is going to be intubated and go to ITU, um, uh, resuscitation decisions. I think uh they can be dealt i mean it's the family dynamic and you may wish to have a group discussion or you may if it's one individual say uh, a daughter or a son you may want to have an individual conversation with them um it's really understanding that i mean they may wish their mum to continue to be alive because that matters to them but it's really what their mum wants and it may take some more time for them to come to understand that, but you can't really push people, um, but you have to help them understand in whose best interest is this. Mike, do you have any tips? Because you've also had a lot of experience in this area too. Um, it doesn't happen frequently, but if it occurs, it takes a lot of time and energy to uh, try to get everyone on board uh, because that's i think the challenge uh, to explain uh, what's in the best interest of uh, of the patient and usually uh, we succeed in in in, in convincing uh, everyone that it's the best to do so uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, it, 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 it may uh, give rise to a lot of questions from the family and it may also uh, cause a lot of uh, delay, uh, which, is, which may not be in the interest of the patient. Uh, so that's the, the most difficult part of it, that uh, you need time, but on the, on the other hand, time may be crucial for the patient. Uh, uh, so you have to find a, a way in between. Thank you. We have a question from the audience asking about timing in that should we be, we obviously don't want to be too sort of morbid about this thing, but dying is part of the natural life cycle and they ask whether we should ask the patients what they want maybe more often or a little bit sooner as per the Danish study that asked about the advanced care directives. So I think what they're getting at is, should we say at clinics, how are you getting on with, with your treatment? Is this something you want to continue? But it, it's getting that right balance between not, not sort of saying we can take it away from you, but actually not, not addressing the elephant in the room, if that makes sense. Yes, I, I... I know what you mean, Michelle, and often it's very easy in the clinic to focus on practicalities and different masks and different tubing and uh, a whole host of other other simple issues. Um, I think open questions. So um, how do you see things going? How do you see things going over the next few months? How do you see things in six months time? Um, this treatment is here to support you and to support your quality of life. Uh, it's up to you though, it's your decision. Um, and so I think that round the ventilator is, it's, it's here for you for as long as it helps you. It's quite a useful phrase because people will then say, what do you mean by that? And then you can say, if you wish, it is possible for this to be withdrawn. Uh, this is perfectly legal and perfectly ethical. On the other hand, other people choose to continue it and choose to continue it until the end. Um, so this is your choice. And I think as you, as you get a response from the patient, you can take it further as necessary. I think you have to be relatively explicit, otherwise, um, I think most of the evidence suggests that the patient is ahead of you. If you see that you're raising surprise, you know, I, I, that this is something that is not something for them that day, then, then, you can, you, then you can back away. But it's more often that the patient is thinking about it 
and not knowing how to raise it with you rather than the other way around. Mike? Yeah, that's an interesting topic. Um, um, besides explaining the uh, advantages and drawbacks of, of uh, home ventilation, uh, we try to uh, ask from the first visit, uh, if possible, about the expectations and wishes uh, patients uh, may have. And particularly in patients with motor neuron disease, um, I found it uh, very rewarding to bring up the issue of the end of life. Uh, coming from the Netherlands, I work now in Belgium, and as you may know, in Netherlands we are uh, considered somewhat straightforward. Uh, in Belgium, <laughs> that's a little little less. So at first, the neurologists here they were scared that I brought up a theme like this, and patients as well, but. Nearly all patients are grateful that they could talk about it because it's a, a, a topic which is often not mentioned while they have questions for themselves, not only about the quality of life, but also about the quality of dying. And that's a subject which is not often, uh, uh, which should be talked about much more, I think. So uh, at each visit, uh, uh, we talk about that uh, if the patient wishes. Uh, we, we have a look at the, the written will. Uh, I always ask patients to write a will where they state what they do want and what they don't want. Uh, many patients choose for euthanasia, uh, which is legal in, uh, in Belgium and Holland. Uh, but there are also patients uh, uh, who, who don't want that and they are not aware of the possibility to withdraw uh, NIV or home ventilation. Uh, uh, in, in a, let's say, a rather pleasant way, particularly when it's done at home. Fantastic. And we've got a question around GPs in that they don't often have very much or really limited experience around home mechanical ventilation. What would you recommend the GP to do? So if the patient goes to the GP primary? Uh, I think this is a, a perfect situation for liaison with the palliative care team so palliative care would need to be involved in the home ventilatory support team so they may be familiar with doing this working with a palliative care team but if it can be done jointly then um, I, I don't think the expectation should be for someone to do this for the first time but it's a you know multidisciplinary effort and so that's what I would recommend um, that the palliative care team should be involved I think respiratory medicine teams can deliver palliative care and can do this but often you know we're, we're all involved together in this so that's what I would suggest we do the um, same. Uh, I think the, the involvement of the GP is, is crucial in, in, uh, in the situation that the patient uh, likes to withdraw at home. Uh, but most GPs are not involved in, in, in this. Uh, so you, you really need to take them by the hand to explain things to them. Um, also about the legal aspects, but particularly about the practical aspects. And, some GPs say, no problem, I do a lot of palliative sedation, uh, uh, I know what to do, uh, I have good contacts with a palliative care team and they, they, they can do that more or less by themselves uh, and they can always call us uh, if they have any questions. Uh, sometimes you have a GP who is less uh, secure because they have no experience uh, and they, uh, uh, they can be uh, rerouted to a palliative care team with more experience uh, uh, about the practical aspects, uh, particularly the medication and the IV uh, administration of that. I think that makes the point that it's very different in the Netherlands in that you do have legal euthanasia, whereas yeah. that's not the case in the UK and, and actually the majority of countries. Um, but you do need someone to prescribe the medication, although you know what we've been talking about is not euthanasia at all, it's not assisted suicide. Someone um, from the hospital team or the GP does have to prescribe the medication. Absolutely. We've talked a lot about ALS motor neurone disease, but there's a question about your experience in other neuromuscular disorders. So is it expressed that they want to give up, that they've had enough, that they want their ventilator withdrawn? I appreciate it's not a common topic, but have you seen it in other neuromuscular disorders out of the ALS population? 
Mike, I know I know that's been the case in in Belgium, hasn't it? With with Duchenne patients, I've never seen that in the in yeah. the UK. We've never done a, okay. a withdrawal in the UK. Yeah, we had one patient when I worked in the Netherlands who lived actually in Belgium, uh, <laughs> but he came to Utrecht. Uh, he had Duchenne. Um, he was around 35, 37 years old, and uh, he had so many comorbidities uh, and so many uh, uh, problems, uh, including pain, that he he decided that he didn't want to continue living anymore. So he asked for a withdrawal, and um, that's, I think, the only other neuromuscular patient. We had a patient with kyphoscoliosis, which we described in a Dutch medical journal, uh, who also had a lot of comorbidities, including a platzbauch, uh, needing a, a lot of medication for pain. Uh, he was a very clever veterinarian who, who understood everything, and he really decided uh, uh, on one moment to say it's enough. He was around uh, 65, 67 years old, uh, but it was too much for him. He couldn't, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't mobile anymore. He was. Uh, strain to his, his house, so let's say his quality of life for him uh, became below uh, a red line, and that's why he asked to withdraw the, the ventilation. There's a question going back to the case that you presented with regards to COPD, but this might not be just a COPD patient, but what do you do when regards to the patient keeps telling you that they want to keep on with the ventilator, but they're not using it. So we <laughs> talked, you talked about sort of withdrawing it, not from from an end of life perspective, but withdrawing it. What, what do you do in this situation where they really keep telling you that they, they want to, but they never do really? That's an interesting one. I have seen that actually. I've. <laughs> um, I, I think there are some people that can't use it for the whole time that if they become much more symptomatic during ex exacerbation. If it's at home, they may use it then, and they may use it for short periods, but those periods may be better than nothing. I'm aware of one patient who found reassurance by having a ventilator in the corner of their room. Um, you know, it's probably not, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether it's cost effective or not. Um, it's a relatively unusual situation, but I, I do think it's more likely that if you, you can't cope with it when you're in relatively steady state, you may be able to cope with it when you have an exacerbation and then your user and that may keep you out of hospital. So maybe, <laughs> maybe it would happen that way. I'm not sure. <laughs> Mike? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one, but um, I agree fully with Anita. It, it, it doesn't occur very often, um, but if it occurs, the question is always, what what's the reason? Uh, yes. So we invite the patient uh, to visit us or we visit the patient at home if possible, uh, because sometimes some patients are not able to visit the hospital anymore. So first we have to convince ourselves that, that we, we can't do anything to help the patient. And even then, and the question is, does the patient want to continue or, or to, to keep the, the device or not? And usually we agree in doing that uh, because it gives a feeling of safety. And uh, as Anita said, it's not cost effective, uh, but uh, sometimes you have to be, let's say, more kind <laughs> than, you, than you need to be. So uh, I think that that's, it's important that you reassure the patient and that, that you uh, have a look together uh, what can be done uh, to, to improve the situation, as long as the patient wants that. I'd like to thank you both for your time and an excellent discussion. I totally agree with you, Anita, it, with regards to the quote. It's about um, how the memories of how people, the memories that are left with the people that live on, and, and that really is important. So thank you again.